Mr. Fiegels, did you Ooh. enjoy the football this weekend, bud? Yeah, great games. Uh, not not a big fan, as you know, of last week's games, but this last this last week's games, I was. I think that these were really good. Um, and we got a heck of a matchup coming into Championship Sunday here, so it's going to be a lot of fun to watch these teams. Lance, and I guess we can start here. Uh, my takeaways generally, you know, from, from the weekend is that things get tougher in the playoffs when, you know, offense can look easy a lot of times during the, the regular season, but in the playoffs, it, get, it gets a lot tougher. And we talk all year, Lance, about the importance of turnovers and takeaways. And we discussed that Bucks saints game late last week. I'll start there. And we both kind of talked about um, with, the Saints, we thought they would have to win the game with their defense. Well, their defense played extremely well. Unfortunately, their offense put them in some very bad situations. Yeah, and their offense had been shaky going back to the Chicago game as well. So I'm not necessarily stunned with what happened. But, I mean, I think you hit it right in the nose. The turnovers absolutely killed them. The Saints had four turnovers. The last one really didn't matter because that pretty much closed up shop. But the Bucks scored 21 points off of the previous three turnovers. And this actually goes back to themes that, you know, the three of us have talked about all season as it pertains to the Giants. My biggest theme that I took away from this past weekend, really all four of the games, is just the efficiency of things compared to these teams versus teams that didn't make the playoffs. What do we talk about all season? Turnover differential dictated wins and losses for the Giants. Okay, well, we just talked about that. The other thing that I thought came back to haunt certain teams was red zone inefficiency. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, guys, how the Colts couldn't capitalize in the red zone against the Bills. That was a big difference maker. Well, the Ravens were able to move the football against Buffalo, and then they got inside the 20, and they couldn't put it into the end zone for a touchdown. And that, I thought, was a big reason why Baltimore didn't take care of business. You had the pick six, you had some missed field goals, and then you had the turnover on downs. It wasn't as yeah. if Baltimore didn't have its chances. It's just they had no points to show for the ball movement. Yeah, yeah, and I will say this about the Ravens, guys. And look, Lamar Jackson's a very good football player, but he has to become a better thrower of the football if the Ravens are going to win a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, they can run their offense the way they do, and it's great. And I'm not saying he's a bad quarterback. He's a good quarterback. And he doesn't have to throw the ball like Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes, but he needs to get above average as a thrower. He just has, you know, too many plays where, you know, eventually you're going to need your quarterback to, to make, to, to, to convert a third and long, to launch a comeback. You know, some of those things where he's going to have to win the game through the air, and I just don't think Lamar Jackson is good enough at that yet for him to be um, a Super Bowl quarterback if they need to rely on the offense to win him games. Yeah, and the thing about when going back to the playoffs last weekend, when you talk about the Saints and the um, the Bucks game, you know what got what got the Saints there all season was not turning the football over and playing good defense. So, you know those types of things. And you know what comes down to a lot of these games, guys, and that when when the playoffs start and divisional games and going into this championship weekend, it's the big plays. And some of the plays that happen and, and some of the calls on the field. And, you know, you look at the way Andy Reid, how aggressive he played on that fourth down play. I mean, I thought Tony Romo was going to jump out of the booth after that after that happened. <laughs> you know, so things like that happen in these types of games. And... I almost fell off my couch. I mean, you have Chad <laughs> Henney in there on a fourth oh and one goodness. and you're throwing the football? Wow, I mean, that is some guts. And you think about all the ramifications – from snap to catch to throw and everything, right? So you've got a you got a shotgun snap now. Could be a bad snap, could be a drop snap. Then you got to then you got to throw the ball. Could be an incompletion, turnover on down. And it was could also an interception. Move, it was a moving pocket too, where he's on the move making that. So throw. a lot of different things that kind of went into that, and it's just you know these are the type of decision making that these coaches have to come down to in big big games when you get to the end of the season like this. So um, yeah, and it's 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 exciting to watch. Um, you just hope that, you know, some of you look at the Browns game and that, you know, we, talk, we talked about this on the air. We talked about this, that, that play about reaching the ball out, you know, touching across the line of scrimmage. Um, there, there's things like that that you just don't do and teams don't teach that play. Well, the Cleveland Browns certainly have never taught that play. And, you know, you have a play like that that impacts the game. And, you know, if you're, if you're the Cleveland Browns looking back at that game, you're surely sitting there going, you know what? We had these guys beat. Yeah, we really did. And Lance, and Joe Judge has taught that. He says that publicly that he teaches his guys not to reach out for no. that football unless it's fourth down because to avoid just that. 
Yeah. Well, that's a New England philosophy. I think Judge basically got it from Belichick because if you ask any former Patriots players, they say that Belichick really no, gets no. on guys. <laughs> he, he won't let them live it down if they decide to reach out for it. And to Jeff's point, when you lose a game by, what, five points? Yeah, mm-hmm. you wish you had that red zone possession back because they would have taken over on the two-yard line if he was just not cleanly out of bounds with the football. And listen, there's no guarantee you're going to score a touchdown. So I get what Higgins' logic was. Hey, if you have an opportunity, try to do it, but then you wish you at least maybe had a field goal mm-hmm. out of all of that as opposed to completely losing the possession, especially a game like the Kansas City Chiefs. Quick sidebar to what Jeff was talking about with Chad Henney. Guys, I actually think it was a blessing in disguise, and you know we could debate a lot of the pros and cons to resting starters and the playoff implications that that presents for teams that may have missed out on an opportunity to get to the postseason, but the fact that Henny actually played that entire game in Week 17 because Kansas City had nothing to play for, I point. think that actually was extremely beneficial because then Mahomes gets hurt, and as opposed to Henny playing for the first time in months or seasons, you have him playing for the first time in about the span of two weeks. That actually has not been <laughs> talked about enough. I think that was actually extremely beneficial. Yep, and you get into that conversation about resting guys and you know the whole – uh, Doug Peterson putting the, the third teamer in there to get reps and that kind of stuff. Yep. You know, listen, if that if that situation, it warrants what happened. You know, you are going into the to the playoffs and you want to rest your guys. And and Chad Henney gets a whole game to to work out the cobwebs because he certainly hadn't played a lot during the regular season. In fact, he hasn't played a lot in his career. I, it was funny. I was watching the game with my boys and I was like, how many touchdowns do you guys think that that uh, Chad Henney has in his career? And we kind of come to the, before we looked it up, the over-under was 50. And I took the under. I took the under because I just didn't think that he had that many. Well, he might have started a, at least one full year for Miami, right, Henny? It's a good question. I, I would take over-under 50. I would probably go just over on that. Lance, what would you go on that? I would have went just over in mm-hmm. terms of 50 career touchdowns. The because number, he's been in the league. Remember, he's been a veteran guy well, that's been on a number years, of teams. Right? 12 years, yeah. Uh, the number was 60. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> so, about right. You know, yep. um, but you're right because there were some years when he first was drafted coming out and then he got to play, you know, some seasons where he was the guy. But then, you know, but it just goes to show you how important that backup quarterback position can sure. be for a team. It really does. And by the way, this is going to be the microscope judges every move. What did he do on the practice field? Is Patrick Mahomes going to clear concussion protocol? Mm -hmm. This is going to be just a drama-filled week trying to figure out whether or not that guy is going to be able to play because clearly that is the biggest storyline we'll be keeping an eye on all week long now, Lance. And we know, we know how these, these concussions, uh, can 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 act you know they're just you never know each person's different Sterling Shepard look what happened to him how many games he left well I remember this is not just the team now this is the NFL mm-hmm. and their independent evaluator that has to approve this too mm-hmm. yep so the hit actually did not look that terrible when no you saw it, it really firsthand. didn't it didn't and it wasn't a helmet to helmet hit it was just sort of an awkward a twisting glancing. of the head yeah. It looked like. So, you know, maybe that makes it promising that he can get back. And I don't know if you guys saw, but when he went to the sideline, he went into the blue tent and then they took him back to the locker room. He was running. He was (laughs) racing back to the locker room. So, you know, when I saw that, but once again, to your point, (laughs) how you feel on Sunday could be very different than how you feel on Tuesday or Wednesday. I had had plenty of concussions in my career. (laughs) Okay. And I will tell you, I was, well, first of all, there was never a blue tent. Second of all, (laughs) I was never running like that after I had a concussion. (laughs) I basically didn't know where I was at or thrown up somewhere. I mean, that, so that is good news, and I, I think that he will play. I, of course, I, I don't know, you. but uh, I think that it'll be good for the game, and I think it'll be good for the Chiefs. Well, the one thing we haven't touched on, guys, and I guess we should, is the game from Saturday night. I know it was Saturday afternoon, and pardon me, the, the, the Packers and Rams, and this is how I relate this game back to the Giants. You know, the Rams, I think, play a very similar style defense to what the Giants do. It's a lot of two safeties deep. It's a lot of zone coverage. They don't allow any big plays. And we saw the Packers. And by the way, I think that is the way you should play defense these days because I think big plays are the easiest way for you to get beat. Mm -hmm. And the Packers showed the blueprint of how to beat a defense like that. And I, I, this is one of the few things I tweeted over the weekend. I tried to stay off Twitter as much as I could, but the Packers well, you just tweeted about had... the Knicks all weekend, though, so let's not forget about that. <laughs> no, nah, I wasn't on. I was barely well, on Twitter at all Saturday recap. and Sunday. Come on, let's not shy away from that, but go ahead, yes. Um, so, to me, the Packers did so much 
right in that they had no negative plays. They didn't allow any sacks. They didn't have any offensive penalties. And it wasn't these huge... They had, they had that one chunk play later, sure. But you had five yards here, six yards there, four yards here, eight yards there. And it was these long, sustained drives. And that's the formula for the Rams and it was for the Giants this year too, right? Make the other team sustain long drives and eventually you'll either get a sack or they'll make a mistake or there'll be a fumble and you can walk away without giving up any points. Well, the Packers were so efficient that they were just able to methodically move the ball up and down the field all game long against what was the best defense in the league this year, and that to me was just so impressive. Mm. That offensive I thought line. they ran the ball very well. Mm-hmm. 188 yards over yep. five yards of carry. I also think it helped that they pretty much made sure Aaron Donald, even with the injury, wasn't going to be a disruptive force that he typically is. I thought the offensive line for Green Bay yes. probably is not going to get enough credit coming out of that game because of, of course, what Aaron Rodgers did. And Aaron Jones had a 60-yard run to start the third quarter. But the line I mean, kept an extremely clean pocket. They kept the Rams' defensive front away from Aaron Rodgers. They didn't sack him once. They had one quarterback hit. And if you look at what the Rams did to Russell Wilson in the two regular season matches, and then the postseason matchup, guys, they sacked Russell Wilson 16 times in those three games. They yeah. got after him. They were opportunistic. Yep. To me, the offensive line for the Packers completely took the Rams' aggressiveness out of that game. And that's why, to John's point, I think they were able to put together lengthy drives because there were no negative plays to be had. There was no opportunities to creep into the backfield and have Aaron Jones lose two yards or so. And Aaron Rodgers, of course, is always going to take care of the football. So the Rams have relied on those opportunistic plays. There was nowhere to be found throughout the course of the game. And that's, to me, a big reason why Green Bay was able to methodically march down the field. They had three touchdowns of 73 yards or less. So it wasn't as if they were getting great field position and a blink of an eye were scoring touchdowns. They had to earn those touchdowns. Yeah, that offensive line for the Seattle Seahawks, we know it was not the biggest, the greatest thing in the world. So, But, you know, looking at that game the other night and just watching how much time, uh, you know, an Aaron Rodgers has to throw to football and make decisions, I mean, you, you can't give a guy like that all the time in the world. He will just pick you apart. Um, and then there's going to be a big play here or there. But, you know, to John's point, they just kind of just, they, they just went down the field the way they were. And, um, you know, and if you can run the football and set up play action, uh, that's what they did. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they, the Green Bay team, will attack this Bucks defense because, you know, it's very similar as far as the, their defense is. They have good front fours. We know. These are teams that the Giants have all played and we've studied. So it's, it's going to be an interesting matchup. But, you know, listen, I think that any time that you can give Aaron Rodgers the time that he needs to, to go ahead and just pick you apart, you're in trouble because he's not only good, he's smart. And he can key in it. Have you seen the video about him laughing when he gets under center? I, they saw it on Good Morning Football this morning. I was watching. They had a video on there of Jaron Rodgers getting up to the line of scrimmage and calling out his signals and just kind of has this little smile on his face. And you know, it's, it's and they should, I didn't show the play, but you knew that he was going somewhere where the matchup was in his advantage. And that's what I'm talking about. You just can't give him that type of opportunities. All right, the final thing, guys, we'll talk about here before we get to your calls at 973-667-1960, 973-667-1960. Big Blue Kickoff Live, of the course, is brought to you by the New York Lottery, the new X series of scratch-offs from the New York Lottery. Multiply your winnings up to 100 times. Please play responsibly. The NFL with some sad news, at least for, for us, because we like covering it. Uh, but the NFL Combine will not be taking place in Indianapolis this year. And, and we could talk about this more during the week, but we should get the news out there. And, guys, this is going to be a really, really – we thought last year's draft process was odd. Well, this is going to take it to a whole new level now because you're going to have all these kind of regional events where you have medicals being done in major cities. You have, you know, players basically only testing is going to be done at their pro days, but they're going to work with, you know, scouts and NFL teams to make sure all those tests are uniform. Good luck with that. So we're going to be coming into this. And by the way, that means no in-person meetings at the Combine either with these players. For everything, all of that will be done virtually. So this is going to be the most difficult process for these teams this year to get the right information, to make the right picks, not even mentioning the guys that opted out this year and didn't play that could be first-round picks. So it is going to be a real challenge, guys, to get all the information and accurate information to make the right calls on these players 
based on what happens during this process between January and April. Hmm. Well, remember, on top of that, the volume of games yep. that some of these players took part in fluctuated throughout the season <clears throat> because you yep. had some conferences that got in, right, 11, 12 games, and you had others where you know, they were lucky if they got five or six games in. So the film this year is also going to be tough because you know, more often than not, we talk about this every offseason, the film, the game study is the most important. Listen, you could wow somebody in an interview. You could have great measurables. But at the end of the day, you always go back to the film and the tape. But if the film and the tape this year doesn't have the same substance as it did in previous years and you don't have the same exposure to players at the Combine, I think it makes for even more of a guessing game or more of leaning on maybe what you learned about a player his sophomore year as opposed to his junior year or whatever it may be. So, yeah, it's another obstacle thrown in the way of all of these executives and scouts. I think at least there's the good news of there will be some semblance of a pro day. The numbers may fluctuate, but at least they'll have some workouts to run players through. And I just think it's going to be the teams that do their due diligence in finding other ways to interact with college coaches and the individuals on campus. Because remember, I think a lot of scouts will tell you it's when they get on campus and sometimes they'll talk to a trainer from the team just to get an idea of what the player is like behind the scenes. Those conversations that usually take place in person, I think that's where a lot of scouts and executives are going to miss out on. And you hope that maybe you'll be able to get some of that through a phone call or through a Zoom well, chat, yeah. even though you're not there in person. Yeah, and, and Jeff, real quick before you go, you know, most of these schools have not allowed scouts on campus. So I think the advantage is going to go to these scouts that, to your point, Lance, already have these contacts so they can pick up a phone and call one of these guys because – these teams have not been on campus this year to really do that mm -hmm. sort of work on these players, which puts another wrench into the whole equation. I, th I think that the biggest caveat in all of this that we're talking about is probably going to be in your mid rounds, you know, third, maybe not even the yeah, third down your top two rounds. I think th th there's enough information on those guys. And I think the measurables that people are really concerned about, and I think you guys will agree me with me here, medicals. Okay, that's the big one. Uh, they're going to make sure that these guys are healthy, especially when they're going to be investing the type of money they are in first and second rounders. Um, and then the other thing is, is the personal interviews. And even though they're going to be able to do those virtually, at least they're going to be able to have those where, you know, you may not all the other stuff to 40 times. Those are going to be skewed a little bit. Like you said, John, good luck trying to get a uniformity for testing all the way. But to me, I think it's you're going to rely on your scouting department. You're going to rely on the background checks that you're doing for some of the mid-round guys. But I think the upper guys, it'll be a little bit just it won't be as hard. But I think trying to hit on some of those mid-round guys, that's where it's going to be a little bit more difficult this season. Yeah, I think it is, too. And, you know, I do think that the numbers give you a baseline, though, Jeff. And what you said is the most important thing, the interviews and the medical, no question about it. But at some point. If a guy runs a cornerback and he runs like a four five eight forty, that that that's maybe it's not disqualifying, but it's a problem. All right, sure. And you know, if you think some tight end's going to be this big receiving weapon and he runs like a four six eight, you're sitting there. All right, well, maybe not. You know, there's a great. Um, no, it all goes into it. I I agree with right. you. Right, and, and you know, for some positions, there there's there there's a big uniformity, right? You know, edge rushers that run a really good three cone drill. Those are guys that usually mm -hmm. you know translate to the pros. Things like that. So those numbers are important. Yeah, yeah, and they are, and and I think that they all go into one formula of picking, right? I mean, but I, I think that each team has their set of. I guess rules that that are one are important, more important than the others, and you know there's some. But I, you're right, John. It's not just the things that I was saying that are going to be the most important. I think the 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 problem that I'm seeing is that, and like you touched on, is how is this going to be consistent? You know, how is it, the 40 time is probably to have everybody running the same same spot with the same equipment. In one place, that gives you a little bit of, of uh, consistency. Well, I mean, right? Jeff, you can even talk about it, though. I mean, just depending on what field you're on, the the yeah, that's the, right. the type of yeah. turf is going to affect your speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got a, You got a school that's going to do their pro day on turf that hasn't been hasn't been replaced in six or seven years. That could be a faster track than somebody that just came out and put brand new turf in. You know, so there is there is some discrepancies there. You're right. So there is a little bit of a plus or minus error, if you will. So it's interesting to see. I mean, you, you certainly hope that these guys, if they're a 4-5, that they don't come in and run a 4-9. <laughs> you know, so, well, um, I remember that, last year. Remember Cameron Dantzler, the cornerback? 
at the combine, he ran like a four five six or something like that. He shows up at his pro day, runs a four three nine. Like, mm. come on, guys, seriously, really? <laughs> Well, I mean, listen, well, that I, just goes to show you we've seen a fluctuation even mm-hmm. under normal circumstances, yeah. too. Well, yeah. but there's always yeah. a fluctuate. Let me put it this way. There's a reason the pro day times are always faster than the combine times. And, you know, maybe instead of a 40 yard dash, it's a 38 and a half, you know, a uh, 38 and a half yard dash, you know, things like that. They trim but, down on it. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, you, you maybe you start the stopwatch a second later or you stop. You know what I mean? So there are things you can do to, 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 to milk those numbers when you control the workout. So I think it'll be important to have whether it's a Blesto scout or whatever, somebody that does this. Mm-hmm. and can give those uniform numbers to the NFL and their uniform rules from place to place will be very important. That's all I'm saying, Lance. And, you know, every year as these quarterbacks jockey for positions, right, we, we see it every year. Oh, well, this week it's this guy is, is the second highest. And, you know, well, in his pro day he didn't do very well, so now he's down. You know, we're going to have to look at that too because there is a handful of quarterbacks that we'll be talking about um, in this draft this year that could be, you know, Trevor Lawrence, obviously we won't be talking much about him, but you look at the other guys and how, you know, how are they going to fluctuate because of these workouts? You know, is, is, is the scouting services going to rank them higher than some of the pro scouts and the mock 263rd version that we get? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting. Lance but loves I, I guess... mock drafts, by the way. Lance cannot wait for the mock drafts to start coming out. He's all <laughs> yeah, about the I mean, mock They're already it's, out. It's clearly, they, of course, well, they've been out already throughout yeah. the course of the season, yeah. too. Oh, I mean, there's always going to be the speculation. I mean, nothing is more exciting than months before the draft to now talk mm-hmm. about the order in which the players are going to be taken. But just to piggyback off of your point, Jeff, which I think is interesting about the quarterback specifically, I think if you're a multi-year starter, you're not worrying too much because you have had multiple seasons. For example, mm-hmm. Trevor Lawrence, and I know in all likelihood he'll go number one, so it's not going to make or break him, but... If you have multiple years of tape where you're the starter, I think that could put scouts and executives to ease as opposed to if you played five games, right, this year and you had like a breakout campaign, I don't know if necessarily that makes teams feel better about the quarterback because they're going to wish that, well, I would have liked to have seen him maybe for six or seven more games. How about Trey Lance? He played one game. Yeah. He played one game this year. Hmm. Yeah, and how about the the guys that opted out? You know, even the guys that opted out this year for COVID. You know, the guy, some, of those, some of those guys, you're going to have to look at them. They didn't play a snap this year. Well, even a guy like Justin Fields, for example, out of Ohio State, we're talking about they played five regular season games of the conference championship game. So even the sample size in the Big Ten season this year is quite small. Get it that they had also the postseason games too, and I'm not bringing him down as a result of that. But if you wanted to see more, you weren't sure, you were on the fence – once again, you're wondering, is this who I think is going to be the franchise quarterback, or am I not comfortable? And if the workouts alone, which are not game situations, you know, a guy in a pro day could look fantastic because to what we were talking about earlier, he's in his comfort zone. He's working with his own receivers. He's working with his own coaches. Part of, to me, analyzing a player is you want to see them out of their comfort zone. You want to see them working with individuals that they don't always work with because they're going to get to an NFL camp and now they're going to be surrounded by guys on offense that they've never seen before, and they may have never even watched on television. I'd rather see how they adapt that way than give me a workout where he's throwing passes to three or four <laughs> wide receivers that he worked with over the course of an entire season. Trey Lance has played eight, uh, 19 college football games. He's mm. thrown just over 300 passes. And, and 16 of those games were as a sophomore. And this is a guy that a team's probably going to pick in the top 10 with very little information. So it'll be really interesting to see how this end winds up. The New York Giants and Quest Diagnostics want our fans to come back stronger than ever. Now you can order your own lab test through Quest Direct to get the health answers you need most. Let's go to the phones at 